Hi, I am Dr. Felice Gersh, your integrative OBGYN physician. Now we're going to talk about uterine fibroids and menopause and what can happen if you go on hormone replacement therapy and you have fibroids. Well, let's cover a little bit about what fibroids are. The real medical name is leiomyomata or leiomyoma. So it's about having a tumor, a benign tumor that forms in or right adjacent to the uterine muscle wall. Now, what are fibroids? So, and we'll call them fibroids rather than leiomyomata. So fibroids are made of muscle. Now, the uterus as a whole consists of three basic layers. The inside layer is called the endometrium, and it's a layer of glandular tissue. Then you have the muscle or the, um, well, the muscle tissue of the uterus. And on the very outside, you have what? A serosa, kind of like a peritoneal shiny surface. Okay. Now, in the muscle part of the uterus, there are individual muscle cells. Well, for reasons we don't really understand at this point, a single muscle cell, just a single one, can start to clone itself and grow and multiply and create a benign tumor, this uterine fibroid. Now, I just want to make a side note that there is a type of cancer that's a muscle cancer that's leiomyosarcoma. Fortunately, it's quite rare. I've only had three cases that I can think of in my entire career. It's really rare. And the way that you would be concerned about them would be if you had an extremely rapid growth of what is a muscle tumor. It's rare, but if you, especially in menopause, have a rapid growing uterine fibroid, that's a leiomyosarcoma until proven otherwise, okay? So just to be aware, there is this rare chance that what we think is a benign uterine fibroid is actually a cancerous type of tumor. And that's why no one should self-diagnose all of these types of tumors should be followed by your medical expert, you know, a physician or similar qualified provider. So back to benign uterine fibroids. They're extraordinarily commonplace. In fact, if you study people post-mortem, like you do autopsies, or if you did a lot of older ages, you will find that close to 80% of women may have some fibroids. Now, these could be as small you know, really tiny, like the size of a head of a pig. So in talking about location of fibroids, that's actually quite important for symptoms. When they're incursing into the uterine cavity, either partially or completely, that would be called a submucosal fibroid. When they're in the muscle wall, that's intramural. And when they're on the outside, that's called subserosal. So intramural fibroids occasionally will cause problems, not too often, mostly from their size, also subserosal. If they're very large, they may cause pressure on the rectum or on the bladder. So some women, just like in pregnancy, may have to go frequently to the bathroom or get urgency because it presses, you know, puts pressure right on the bladder. They can cause bad bleeding, heavy cramps, they can cause pressure symptoms or just a weight. When they're very heavy, remember, it's solid muscle. It can cause a pressure feeling in the pelvis, which can be very unpleasant, okay? So there are times when uterine fibroids should be addressed, and they can be addressed by having them removed. That would be a myomectomy. That's a surgical procedure. They can be removed with the whole uterus. That's called a hysterectomy. And there are some other procedures. For example, you can do an embolization where you embolize the uterine arteries, which will then cut off the blood supply for a while to the fibroids and the uterus. And the fibroids would then die and shrivel up to some degree. They're not going to disappear. It's matter. But they die and they kind of shrivel up by often at least one third. They'll get smaller, sometimes even more. There are other procedures like radiofrequency where they're basically bombarded with this energy source that would kill them. There's 
cryosurgery where they get frozen. So there's a variety of new treatment. If they're into the uterine cavity, they can be potentially excised with a hysteroscopic surgery. And then when they're small or they're uh, going into the cavity, they could also be potentially treated by ablating the uterine lining, destroying the uterine lining so that even though they'll still be there, the bleeding will stop. So all those things can happen. That's sort of background on uterine fibroids. But what about in menopause? Are they stimulated by hormones? Well, let's go back to how they're even formed. I said they're starting, they're originating from a single myocyte. A single muscle cell is how they originate. So why would it even grow? One reason, there's genetics. If a family member, a mother, a sister, a grandmother had uterine fibroids, then you're more likely to have uterine fibroids. Also, if you have inflammation, it turns out that the uterine muscle, which contains some stroma like connective tissue along with the muscle, guess what? It has the enzyme aromatase that we talk about so often. The enzyme aromatase converts androgens. Most of them come from the adrenal gland. They're like the male type hormones and they convert the androgens into estrogens. Now, the most common estrogen that would be made from androgens from the adrenal gland is estrone. Estrone is the specific estrogen that predominantly activates the estrogen receptor alpha. Alpha is the estrogen receptor that promotes growth, growth factors. Now, growth factors are wonderful, but not when they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So what can happen is if you have inflammation in your body, you can have inflammation in your uterine muscle wall, and that inflammation will turn on the enzyme aromatase, causing locally produced estrone in the uterine muscle. Can you imagine this is what happened? And that can trigger growth of a uterine fibroid. So. Anything that you can do to reduce inflammation will help to reduce uterine fibroids. So what kind of associations have we seen in women who have uterine fibroids? Well, how about hypertension? Well, hypertension is an inflammatory process. There's an association between hypertension, high blood pressure, and women having uterine fibroids. So what are the things you can do to lower inflammation? eat an anti-inflammatory diet. That means lots and lots of plants, lots of fiber foods, no processed foods, please, no ultra processed foods whatsoever, and not having huge amounts of saturated fats, which tend to be actually pro-inflammatory. And of course, as part of the don't eat ultra processed food is don't eat added sugars or sugary foods type things like high fructose corn syrup, exercise, working on stress, avoidance of chemical toxicants that can add xenoestrogens, fake toxic estrogens into the body. So all of these things can help reduce the risk of fibroid development and fibroid growth. Now, what about progesterone? Well, it turns out that there are receptors in the uterine muscle for both estrogen and progesterone, which isn't really surprising because it is a reproductive organ. So progesterone doesn't create the same growth effects as estrone in this case, but there are progesterone receptors in the uterine muscle. Well, progesterone causes the extracellular tissue to become more growth oriented. So the extracellular tissue, the extracellular matrix, that's the like connective tissue that surrounds the fibroids and are into internal into the fibroids. So progesterone has a unique special effect and it also supports the growth and proliferation of the uterine muscle fiber cells. So it's a supporter, but it also promotes essentially the growth of uterine fibroids. That's why there have been proposed drugs that block progesterone receptors that can help to shrink uterine fibroids. So let's get back to menopause, okay? So say you have uterine fibroids 
and now you're going into menopause, your hormones, both progesterone and estradiol, are decreasing. Can I give you hormones? The answer is yes. Wherever you look in the conventional world, wherever, it is not an absolute contraindication. So that's really important to know. So of course you can take hormones, okay? Even though you have fibroids. But will the hormones stimulate the fibroids? The answer is it could. I mean, I can't lie to you. I'm never gonna lie to you. The answer is yes, they could stimulate. What's the probability? Interestingly, it's not really that high because the estradiol isn't really the biggest problem. It's the locally produced estrone. So if you can keep the inflammation down, that will help. That said, still, estradiol also creates proliferation because um, it does. that's what it does too. So you could grow them. So what does the research show? The research shows that if they're going to grow, they tend to grow in the first two to three years. And then it seems to stabilize and may even start to get smaller. The fibroids get smaller. So they did a study comparing growth of fibroids in women who were treated with hormone therapy and women with similar uterine fibroids who were not given any hormones. Interestingly, the patients with or without the hormones seem to have the same approximate growth of their uterine fibroids during the first year of the study, which is kind of surprising, but that's what the study showed. In the second year, the fibroids definitely grew more if they were going to grow. Now, they didn't grow in every, in every woman, but when they did grow, they definitely grew more in the women who were on the hormone therapy. Now, what about in the third year? Interestingly, they tended to stabilize and even get somewhat smaller in the third year. Now, here's another problem. All of the studies that are out there, they're predominantly, if not exclusively, using the hormones of the time, which were things like Prempro. So we actually have a scarcity of really good data using bioidentical transdermal estradiol and vaginal progesterone. Where's the data? Oops, I don't really have it. But going by the data we do have, yes, there is a risk that they could grow and they should be followed. If you have uterine fibroids and you go on hormones, they should be followed. They don't have to be followed like every three months. That would be excessive, but you could have an exam once a year and maybe, you know, if there's a question, get an ultrasound. They don't have to be like ultrasounded all the time because what if there's just a very small amount of growth? So what do you, you know, it's not really anything to be concerned about. You want to look at, you know, significant growth or significant symptoms that are developing. A little tiny bit of growth that becomes stable is not a problem. Uterine fibroids are so common. Remember, as many as 80% of women, by the time they get past menopause, may have at least some fibroids. So we don't have to do extreme excessive monitoring, but some degree of monitoring is essential for women with fibroids who go on hormones. If the fibroids are really large, if they really do grow, then you only have two choices. In my opinion, if they're really growing, you should have a hysterectomy because that's pretty extreme because that doesn't happen that often and you really want to rule out a leiomyosarcoma. If it were my choice, which it, I just put in my two cents, but if it were me, I would rather have a hysterectomy if I had uterine fibroids that were growing rather than not have any hormone therapy. But of course, it's to each individual woman to decide what she would want to do should that happen. But remember, going on hormones with uterine fibroids is not an absolute contraindication. It's always allowed. You should do it being aware that they could possibly grow. Usually it is not a problem. I can think of maybe in my entire career, maybe two women who had a problem with growth of uterine fibroids. And I treat so many women with hormones in menopause, but it can happen. So you have to be aware it is a risk, you know, so you have to put your priorities in order. What, what do you want to do? But fibroids are common. There's a very high chance that you'll have them, but you may not ever know it. And it won't even matter if you do. So fibroids are common. They're not a contraindication. 
lowering inflammation helps reduce fibroid growth and fibroid development. Like everything else, keep inflammation at bay.